title of the message or a series, we'll just probably try and keep it down to two parts, um, is defending your faith. Amen. Amen. Can someone say that after me? Defending your faith. faith. I would have called it defending the, the faith that I said I don't want this message to be hanging out there in the air. So by saying defending your faith, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to us individually. And those who are listening, I'm talking to you. If you're listening to this, defend, defending your faith. When you hear the word defending or defense, it suggests something. It suggests that there is an opposition. Yeah? It, is, it does suggest that there's an, op- there's an opposition against your possession. An opposition against what belongs to you, your possession. All right? Might be a good day today to make a note. Because I've got some few. Po- <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> I like someone just said, I've got a pen and paper here. Yeah. <laughs> good time to make a note. If you've got an iPhone, whatever, just make some notes. Amen. Please. And I probably will start encouraging us to do so. I want us to be students of the word. Students in the sense that we study to show ourselves approved. Amen. And we learn because at the end of the day, when you get the word on, when you get discipled, it's not so that your belly will be so full of the word. It's so that you give it out. So that you give it all out. So when you study, make notes and things like that, you have, you're preparing yourself because one day the Lord might say to you, I'm calling you to this. You've got materials to work with. Amen. So make your own notes. Okay. So again, I start by saying, defending your faith. When you hear the word defending the defense, it suggests that there's an attack against, number one, the attack is imminent. It's happening. That's what it suggests, number one. And that opposition is against your possession. If you if you enter into a defensive mode, okay, you do that to keep what belongs to you. You know, like sometimes when someone attacks your ego and you it's something that belongs to you, and I'm using it in a negative sense now. Do you get my point? So when they send someone is very dis- defensive, they are defending something they hold that belongs to them, maybe their pride, their ego, or whatever, okay? Now, but the key thing as well, there's three things I mentioned in here. The the next one is that to defend means to fight. It's like you're taking on a stance for fight, yeah? So, but you find that you fight to keep what is valuable to you. You know, something you consider priceless, what do I mean? For example, I may just have a piece of chocolate now, and it's not um, sneakers, it's Mars, Mars bar. Yeah? I don't really like Mars bar. And someone wants that and took, takes it. I'm like, oh, Joyce, that's fine. But you touch my sneakers? I'm like, who d- how dare you? Who? I'm putting up a fight. I value that more than this. I'm using common things to explain this. So when we put up a fight of defense, we're doing so because we value what we're defending. The word says to us here, uh, the title of the message is defending your faith. So the question is, is your faith valuable to you in the first place before you can put up a fight for it? And if it's not, hopefully by the time we finish this series, we should see why you should defend your faith. Amen. All right. Okay. So, Jude, verse 3. Let's turn our Bibles to Jude, verse 3. Dear friends, I had been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation we all share. But now... I find that I must, I feel the need to underline the word must. 
Why is that? When you hear someone say, I'm about to tell you this, but no, I feel the need that I must tell you something. There's a sense of what? Urgency and importance. In the business world, and Simon probably and some of you here will understand that they talk about when something is important and urgent, that is something you want to straight away get onto doing. It's not just what is important. It's not just what is urgent. But something that is important and urgent is what you should be doing now. Amen. That is what the scripture suggests to me from Apostle Jude. Writing to the children of God, he says, I have been eagerly planning to write to you about salvation that we all share, but now I find that we, I must write to you about something else. Urging you to defend the faith. That, that's where we get our title. Defend the faith. But I took out the word the and I put you. So I want you to personalize it. Yeah? That God has entrusted once and for all time to his holy people. If I'm paraphrasing, I will say it this way. I wanted to write to you about salvation. But no, 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 no. That is not that urgent now. It is important, but it's not urgent. What is urgent now is that I must write to you about your faith. That you fight for your faith. That faith was given to you as a gift from God once and for all. In other words, there's not going to be another crucifixion for you to get faith. That was done on the cross of Calvary, so it's now up to you to stand in faith and fight to hold what belongs to you. Amen. So there's a sense of urgency in what we're reading. Now, let me just say what I will call a disclaimer, if you like, <laughs> but not necessarily. It's just to, I don't want to use the word balance, but the better word is a disclaimer. Maybe, maybe not. Okay, doesn't matter. My point here is that I'm telling you defend which is already gearing you up. You're feeling like fighting straight away. You're, you're, you're getting ready for, this is going to be me doing it. But before we go any further, the same Jude tells us in verse 24 of the same chapter that it is God that defends and that is able to keep you. So what am I trying to say? That's why I call it most a disclaimer, but it's not. It's just to say, even though I'm encouraging you to fight, don't think you're going to fight in your own strength. Amen. It's not going to be in our own strength. Jude 24 says, Now in all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away. I like the word falling away. So it takes it to another level. It's not just about falling into sin. It's about losing your faith. Amen. Are you with me? Is it too hot? A little bit hot. Maybe we should open that window at the side or something. Yeah? Okay. So, falling away. He is able to keep you. For, and he, what he will do. And will bring you with great joy into, into his glorious presence without a single fault. Amen. A single fault. God is able to keep your faith. Okay, I want to say this in the beginning so you don't lose, or someone hearing this doesn't say, maybe he's telling them that they're going to fight and they're they the one fighting. No, 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 no. God is the one that keeps us, but we have a part to play. Amen. And by the time we hear this message, you see your own part to play. Amen? Yeah, so you see your own part. One of the parts, be, it's not in my note, majority of what God wants us to do is to take our position. Take up a position. It's like saying, just stand your ground, plant your feet in, and say, I'm not moving. You, amen. amen. Why am I saying this? We are more than a conqueror. That's what the Bible says that we are. Again, going a little bit to the point on defense. The dictionary meaning of defense, I like that. It uses the word to ward off attack from against an assault or in insult or injury. 
Okay? But I like the part that he says, to attempt to retain, to attempt to retain as a competition, as in a competition against a challenger. In other words, he says, to attempt to retain something. What is it that you're returning? And he used the word, a championship title or position. This gives me a picture of Anthony Joshua. Yeah? Anthony Joshua, I'm hoping that with my many times of going to the gym, that I might look a little bit, just a little bit like, like him. Even if it's two packs, not, not all the way to six. Just God, please. Anyway. <laughs> so Anthony Joshua has gone to battle in the ring, <laughs> done all his moves, and won a title. You would think that everyone should leave him alone to enjoy his title. No, he has to keep on defending his title to be a champion. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Opposition against what belongs to you. That's what I said in the beginning. You have something that is valuable to your championship, world heavyweight champion. You should be sleeping now. No, you have to be in the gym. Still training. Why? Not training to go and get another title. Now I'm training just to keep my title. Do you get that analogy? So Anthony Joshua has to be keep re that six-pack going. He can't just turn to my one-pack. He will lose what belongs to him when a, an attack comes. Yeah, you laugh it off. Well, no problem. I'm the only one with one-pack here. No problem. God will help me at some point. <laughs> Amen. So the guy just goes that and that. Now, why I want you to get this thing? Even though Anthony Joshua had to fight to get this thing, the difference with Anthony Joshua and us is that Christ is the one that has done the fighting but has handed over the title to you. They gave him the belt. He lifted it up when he went to heaven. And he came down and he said, show me you. And he put it around your own waist. And he's now positioned you as the champion on earth. And then you can, amen. amen. But guess what? <laughs> this is where we come in. God has done the work. And he is able to keep you from falling but there is things that we need to do to stand. That's why I say our own is just about standing as champions. No matter what happens, they say, I am who God says I am. I am who God says I am. I belong to him, belongs to me. Although the wind is shaking me, I'm feeling like falling and it looks like I'm going to lose my belt. It looks like my faith is about to fall. I'm holding my faith on the ground. Amen. That is a picture I want you to get. So God is able to keep us. That's what Josh, uh, Jude said towards the end of that message. Of even though he says, fight, fight this fight. But in the end, he says, don't forget that God is the one able to keep you from falling. Amen. Amen. So, having said all this, why then should we? Let's talk about why should we. So, we are more than a conqueror, yeah? Because Christ, has, like Anthony Joshua, has done the fighting got the belt, but he has given it to us here on earth to stand for him. Bible says, behold, you are, we are Christ's ambassadors here on earth, representative of his kingdom. Okay, so why then should we defend? Should you defend your faith? So a lot of what I'm going to be saying is a lot of, about you. And when I say you, I'm including myself, but bear with me if I say you, because I want that to ring in your hand talking to individuals. Why am I talking to the individuals? The Bible says the just shall live by faith. You have to live by your own faith. Simon, as close as we as friends, will not live by my faith. Okay? My faith can help him up every now and then, but my faith will not give him a constant victory the rest of his life. Amen. Amen. Only for kids, 
It's only children, like parents, that we can hold them to some extent to it. But there will come an age, like my son who's going to get baptized by age and some and salute and some to, as they're getting baptized, technically what we're saying to them is that, hang on a minute, you've got to have to believe God by yourself now. And you've got to have to stand by your own faith. You're going to have to wake up in the morning and say, God, I love you. God, I want you. God, I want to be, be in your kid, you know, do, the, do things for you. Live by your own faith. So this is why I'm saying, why should you defend your faith? All right. Number one. On that why should we defend your faith, if you're making notes, is you are created to please God. You are created to please God. You will find that in Revelation 4.11. I'm not going to read that place, but feel free to read it at home. Revelation 4.11, but I can just quickly mention it. The Bible says, you have made all things and for your pleasure... They were created. Amen. Or nothing that was created except by or for your pleasure. So God is invisible. So you can only please him if you believe in him and in his word. God is invisible. You can only please him by faith. By believing in him and in his word. Although you have not seen him physically. Amen. Why am I talking about this? Jesus said something to, um, what's his name? Thomas. Thomas, we know Thomas? Thomas the doubter. Duke has completed the name. I feel sorry for the guy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Say something to him, you believe now because you've seen, but blessed are those who believe although have not seen. We serve a God that we have not seen physically, but your faith is how you please him. The fact that you believe him although not seeing him and believe his word although not sometimes experiencing some of the things that his word has said, and I'm not saying all of the things, some of the things. Amen. Why am I saying this point? Hebrews 11, verse 5 and 6. Hebrews 11, it was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared bef because God took him, for before he was taken up, he was known as a person who did what? Pleased God. Let's read that again. From the beginning he says, It was by faith, it was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. So, by faith. And then why is it that that happened? He disappeared because God took him. Why? Before God took him, what was happened? What happened? Bible says that people know him as a person that pleased God. How did Enoch please God? Enoch pleased God by faith. By believing in a God that in a time, he believed in God in a time when people don't. When people are moved only by sight. It wasn't long after Enoch you have Noah. And this is not in my notes anyway. And then guess what you have in the situation of Noah? People again didn't believe God. When Noah said, God said, the flood is going to happen. I'm going to wipe off everything. God said, I've made this ark to protect you guys. Please come in. No one believed him. Those people did not walk in faith. Noah pleased God, the Bible said. Why? Because of faith. Yeah. Amen. So when you believe, when God says to you, I am your father and I just want you to not worry about your finances again. And then you say, God, amen. 
and I'm never going to worry again, you're pleasing God. Not because your finance is already sorted, but because you believe God and his word. Amen. So this is one reason that you should defend your faith. Because your faith is what pleases God. Your faith is what pleases God. The second one is equally like this first one. Your faith is the basis of your righteousness. Your faith is the basis of your righteousness. None of us are righteous by action before God. The Bible has already said it to us that our good deeds, our actions are what? As filthy as a rag before God. So in other words, you can say I've done so much good deeds, God should be pleased. No, it is your faith in God, the God you're doing the good deeds for, that pleases him. Not necessarily the good deeds itself. Amen? So it's your faith in connected to that, or else anyone who do good deeds is at peace with God. Yeah? So your faith is the basis of your righteousness. We are righteous because faith, because we believe in the Son of God who died for our righteousness. D good scripture for this. Genesis. Genesis 15, verse 5 and 6. Then the Lord took Abraham outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham believed the Lord. Amen. Verse 6. Abraham believed the Lord and the Lord counted him as righteous. Why? If it's on the screen, say it. Why? Because of his faith. Okay? Because of his faith, the Lord counted Abraham righteous. I've got to move on. Now, let's go. I want to take it a little bit to a different dimension now. And here we call this, and probably I'm going to need some of the slides on the screen from this point, please. What makes your faith vulnerable? What makes your faith vulnerable or weakens our faith? Okay? So if you think again about Anthony Joshua, okay? And use that analogy. So you're now the one who gets belt now. You've been given the belt. So think about what could make you lose that belt or at least make you weak to lose that belt. Think of it. So the belt now is your faith, Okay? He's giving you this free gift, which is your faith. That free gift he gave you is what pleases God. Okay, the fact that you're this wearing this faith thing, God is pleased with you. You're a righteous man. You're holy. You're blessed. You're free. But what could make us weak and that our waist cannot hold it and that faith will start <laughs> to try to fall off? So if you think of it in a physical sense, it will probably say stop training, stop gyming, you know, you start eating, overweight, you know, you're just lazy about. And I'm using a physical one. Get that picture. Okay. So the things I'm about to share with us, and there could be more, but I've got three points. Those things that could make us, that could make our faith vulnerable or make it weak. Okay. Again, God is able to keep us, but things can make our faith weak. All right. Okay. If you're making a note, number one of that, so next slide, number one is what? Misunderstanding of God's grace. Amen. A misunderstanding of God's grace. Now, under the point of misunderstanding of God's grace, I have two points. Okay, this is why I said today is a note time. <laughs> it's got to be... Lots of notes, or if you thank God this video as well, you can always check it. So, under the misunderstanding of God's grace, there's two things here. This simply means not understanding the value of God's grace, therefore, now here's those two things, 
abusing its privileges or not benefiting from it. So those are the two things. Misunderstanding of God's grace have two things under it, which is one is abusing its privileges and the other one is actually not benefiting from it. Okay? Now we're going to try to explain those two things. Let's start with Jude. Jude chapter verse 4. That's the next slide, literally. Jude chapter 4, verse 6. Or verse 4, sorry. Yeah, and 6. He says, I say this because some ungodly people have warmed their way into the churches, into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. Okay? That's what Jude is saying in the same Jude we're using today. Some people have crept in into your churches, and this is why he was giving the warning, saying that God's grace just allows you to do. This is what I call abusing the privilege of the grace of God. Okay, that will be under that one. Of course, he goes further to say from few things, and I, I don't have time to read all of that. But the key thing here is you see a point of where someone now says, there's a difference when someone makes a mistake, you know, and they say, wow, God have mercy on me. But there's another thing when you make a mistake and you say, actually, it doesn't really matter. Do you get my point? That now will mean abusing or making, abusing the privilege of grace. Now, and I love what Paul says. Paul says, where grace, where sin abounds, amen, grace even abounds much more. So this is still good news that even when people are still making a mistake, God is still pouring out mercy and grace to us, okay? But he also then goes further and says, shall we then continue sinning so that grace may abound? He says, no, no, we shouldn't do that, okay? So why am I saying this? Remember, I'm talking about something that makes your belt slowly losing your waist, okay? You're not going to lose it completely, but it weakens. I'm talking about what weakens your faith, not what just makes you fall out of faith completely. God is able to keep us from falling away, but abuse of grace and the privilege of grace will weaken our faith. You know why? Sometimes we don't have the confidence anymore to some things, to pray. Maybe you abuse the faith in the area of, abuse your um, the grace in the area of healing and say, it doesn't matter. I'll eat whatever I want to eat. You know, God's grace covers me. Like me, you hang up, you cry when KFC is struggling with delivery. You know? <sighs> yeah. <laughs> So you know what I mean, and then if you're stuffing yourself with that, and then you could be abusing the grace of God in the area of healing. Do you get my point? And you, I decide I don't want to go to the gym. I, wanna, I don't want to exercise. I'm going to sit in my computer, just sit in the computer, I'll eat whatever I want to eat. I'm abusing the grace of God in that area. Do you get my point? Mm -hmm. So before you know it, I start losing my faith in healing. Amen. Before you know it, I start struggling. If they say, let's pray for diabetes, I won't even believe that there's healing over diabetes because I feel like, well, I'm stuffing myself with sugar. There's nothing. So that makes your faith weaken. It weakens your faith. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, but I don't want to dwell on just the abusing of God's grace or, God, or the privilege of grace. Here is another big one. What's this one? Not benefiting from the grace itself. So they're equally wrong. So you have the group on one side, the ones who just say it doesn't matter. Que sera, sera, what will be, will be. I don't care. I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. You know, that's one side. And then you go over to the other side who will say, I'm not doing anything at all because I'm not sure that God's grace will cover me. Do you, get, do you get my point? These ones are the ones who don't even benefit from the grace. W let me read the scripture for us because this is big. Paul had to battle for this throughout his ministry. Th this second part, which is not benefiting from the grace of God. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Next slide. On verse 4. 
1 and 4, verse 1 and 4. He says, so Christ has truly set us, what? Free. Yeah? Now, make sure that you stay free. And don't get tied up again in slavery to what? The law. This sounds like people who are not benefiting from the grace of God. Okay. He says, listen, I, Paul, I tell you this. If you, count, con, count, if you are counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. This is what I'm talking about. People who are still trying to get close to God by what they do. They are not benefiting from grace. That's also an abuse or misunderstanding of grace. It makes their faith weak. They will look pious, but they are not in faith. Their faith is not strong. You see what I'm saying? It's both sides. They will, they will, you know why they will look by us? Because such a person will pray 500 hours. Such a person will fast 40 days. Maybe three times a month. Is it possible? No, three times a year. <laughs> I forgot that, that a month has only 30 and you're fasting 40 days. Gosh, Whew, I need to go. Work on my mat. Um, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> such a person will fast and fast and fast and fast. All their fast is not in faith that is dependent on his grace. So therefore they are not benefiting from what Christ has done. They are not like that guy who's standing with his belt saying, I have this belt but I didn't have to work for it. I got it by faith in what Jesus has done for me. That is a person who's standing in on God's grace. In faith in God's grace. Amen. Amen. That is how you want to benefit. Okay? So, abuse of God, the privilege of the grace and not benefiting from grace. Two things together is a misunderstanding of God's grace. Amen. Is that clear? Those two together, not one. All right. Number two, misunderstanding spiritual realm. This simply is lacking understanding of the things of the spirit, which leads to lackadaisical behavior, especially in spiritual matters. Okay. When we don't understand the significance of what God is doing spiritually, what that produces in us is a lackadaisical, you know, like a very lazy behavior towards that. Okay, we just don't, we think it doesn't matter. Those kind of things weaken our faith too. So a misunderstanding of the spiritual realm. Quickly, I'm just going to read what Jude said here. I'm on purpose staying on Jude. There's lots of scriptures, but I stayed on Jude because Jude is when we're reading. Verse 8 and 10, he says here, this is Interesting. Before, I never understood the scripture, but now I do. He says, in the same way, these people, is referring to the kind of people that abuse grace, these people who claim authority from their dreams live immoral lives, de defy authority, and they do what? Scoff at supernatural beings. They scoff at supernatural beings. Hmm. What do, what's, what's, what's that mean? Hear what the next thing he says. But even Michael, the archangel, he's talking about angel, Michael, the archangel, who is the one of the mightiest of the angels, did not dare accuse the devil, listen to this, of blasphemy, but simply said, the Lord rebukes you. This took place when Michael was arguing with the devil about Moses' body. But these people, verse 10, scoff at things they do not understand. Like unthinking animal, they do whatever their instincts tell them, and so they bring about their own destruction. Let's explain the scripture. Why did he have to explain it? He's trying to say, scoffing at spiritual things, making light spiritual things, it's not a good thing. And he said, even Angel Michael, who you know by then is greater 
through Christ can defeat the devil, still did not scoff at Satan, but rather just presented Jesus to him and said, the Lord Jesus, his blood, rebukes you. What that means is that he didn't take it light, his enemy. He didn't undermine the opposition. One of the worst things we can do is when we, any general can do, is going into battle and think that it doesn't matter about their enemy. Yeah, they come against you and you'll be shocked. Wow, you under, once you underestimate your enemy, you're already on a defeating path. Yeah? Okay. Why is it? This is not to give glory to Satan. No, that's not what it is. But it's about not scoffing at things we do not understand. It's about not scoffing or taking light. For example, if you just say the devil doesn't matter anymore. He's been defeated, by the way. But you now go ahead and say, because when Michael was saying this, devil was already, Christ, the Bible says, Christ was crucified before the foundation of the world. Okay, so even when Michael was demanding for Moses' body, Michael knows already that the devil is defeated. But yet he did not scoff at him. He says, the blood, the Lord rebukes you. He gave respect for that. Jude must have only got this by revelation from the Holy Spirit. And what am I trying to say? You will see that people who scoff at spiritual matters and take it for granted weakens their own faith. Listen to this. I'm going to list some few on, put this on the screen for me. Some few spiritual matters, and then I'm going to read a scripture to us. Scr spiritual matters, our, the enemy of our faith. The enemies of our faith, number one, is Satan and his demons. Yeah? The enemies of our faith, Satan is in. Number two, sin. They are all defeated, by the way, but we do not take them for granted. We should not have a lackadaisical behavior about them. Okay? That's the point here. And number three, death. And which death am I talking about? It's not just dying here on earth. It's separation from God. Amen. Life eternal with God. Or hell, basically, if you like to call it that. Don't scoff and say it doesn't matter. It does. Okay? These kind of things can weaken our faith. But here is where I want you to think of more. Godly principles. Don't scoff at godly principles. Number one, giving to the Lord. Wow. Why did you put giving to the Lord there as a, an important thing? I don't have time. But one day I'm going to teach us on tithing. Okay? And you will see why giving to the Lord is a very high spiritual matter that matters to God. Not because of just you giving your money, but because of the purpose behind that and what God does with what you give. Amen. And I don't have time to talk about that. Number two, talking to God. I like to call it talking to God. Some call it prayer. I call it talking to God. Amen. Talking to God. Don't scoff at those things. The spending time in God's presence, talking to him about what matters to you or even what does, doesn't even matter. Just even about football. It doesn't matter. Just talk to God. Stay in faith. And then number three is loving people. Don't play these things. These are spiritual principles. And I can list many more, but I stayed with three, okay? What we can remember. So if you're making notes, make note of those things. Okay. And finally, under that three, that third, the third point there is misunderstanding fellowship. Misunderstanding fellowship is the third one. When we misunderstand the purpose of our fellowship with one another, or even completely forsake it, that weakens our faith. The Bible tells us about that. Some people have forsaken the gathering of the brethren, and so doing, they have weakened their faith. They've made shipwreck of their faith. Yeah? So these kind of things weakens. I'm talking about things that makes our faith vulnerable. Jude re 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 talks about it in verse 12. He says, when these people eat with you in your fellowship meal, commemorating the Lord's love, they are dangerous reefs that can 
wreck your faith. Why is he talking about these people? They are like dangerous people that can wreck your faith. He says, they are like shameless shepherds who care only for themselves. So these people are in fellowship, but they don't, they are not participating. They are not contributing anything in the fellowship. They are like shepherds who just care for themselves. They are like clouds blowing over the land without rain. Imagine how if you're a farmer and you've been praying for rain and here comes rain, here comes a big cloud. Mm. You're like, God, this is awesome. This is amazing. It's, it's going to happen. And he stays there for three days. No rain. That is so frustrating. So imagine then you can say you have someone who is influential in the community. Who is maybe a prime minister and is part of your fellowship. And then we now need someone to speak up for the fellowship and say we need freedom of speech in the talking about Christ. And the person doesn't pull their weight. That's the kind of thing. I'm using common things to explain this. Does that make sense? So they, are, they only are in the fellowship caring for themselves. They are like trees in autumn that are doubly dead. Double, doubly well, dead. For they bear no fruit and have been pulled up by the root. These people are grumblers and complainers living only for, to, their, to satisfy their desires. In conclusion, what I want to end today's part, because this is a two-part message. Next week, we will now be talking about how to defend your faith. Okay? I focused on a little bit of why you should defend your faith. And now the kind of things that weakens our faith. Okay? Next week, I will also give us another reason for why you should defend your faith. Because there's two one I talked about is pleasing God and righteousness. Your faith is the basis of your righteousness. Next week, I'll tell you the second part of why you should defend your faith and then how you should defend your faith. All these things is from the book of Jude. If you have time, read the book of Jude if you want, if you can, um, or read the Bible, basically. Um, in conclusion, I just want to say to us, stretch your faith. Okay? Keep stretching your faith. What does that mean? This simply means exercise your faith. Okay? And how do you exercise it? Love. Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. The same Galatians that I read. And this is the final scripture I'm going to read today. For we, when we place our faith in Christ, Jesus, Paul is talking, there is no benefit in being circumcised. Or being uncircumcised. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. Amen. Faith expressing itself in love. Whenever we mix our faith with the power of love, that's an invisible armor that the enemy cannot handle. Your faith expressed in loving people. Let the fruit of your faith be seen in your actions. Amen. Amen. This is my encouragement to us today. Let your faith be seen in your action. The fruit of it. Let it be seen in your actions. And that act is an act of love. If you like, read James chapter 2 from verse 14 to 18. This is what James was talking about when he says... Faith without works is dead. It is not about works in terms of what you're doing. I love that book of James. It was about loving people. It was about serving people. Most people read that particular passage of James and they're thinking about law, you know, the law and all that. No, James said it. He says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, and don't show it in by, by your actions, what kind of faith, that kind of faith cannot save anyone. Verse 15. Suppose you see, so you, you see the context on which James is talking about his faith and action. He says, suppose you see a brother or a sister who has no food. 
or clothing and you say goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm and eat well. But, the, that, but then you don't give that person food or clothing. What good does that do? You, so you see, faith itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead without good deeds. This is what James was talking about when he says faith without works is dead. Let me say something here. God has given birth to so another arm of Favor House Church. And we're still working on that and we're praying about this. What is this? It's, n it's to constantly encourage everyone to think about those who don't have good works. We're giving birth to another arm called Favor House AIDS. We're praying, we're meeting, we're planning because what we've been doing with the homeless, we want to do more. Okay? There are people who don't have and those of us who have, it is, it does please God that whatever it is you have, you're putting to action your love by giving. That's what James was talking about. Amen. Of what use is it that you see someone who's poor and you say, oh, my brother is so nice, <laughs> even though your clothes is torn there and torn there, dress well. You know, I have 500 clothes in my, even the ones, I can't even close my cupboard, my wardrobe, and I say, dress well. See you, see you next Sunday. Yeah? James calls that faith that has no works. Amen. So how you strengthen your faith is by expressing your faith through love. That's what Paul was talking about. Amen. Is that good? Father, we thank you. We thank you for you have told us to defend our faith. There's a whole lot in this message. It's just not even enough time to talk about it. What will be good for us is actually to take time to discuss this rather than just to hear it from one man. But to spend time and deliberate and discuss this and find out the areas where we can tighten up so that we can stand like a who you say we are, which are more, we are more than a conqueror. We are that man that has, is wearing a belt of victory that hasn't even fought for it. But our own fight is a fight of stance, which is a fight of faith. To take our position and stand and hold on to the gift that you've given us, which is Christ Jesus and his wisdom and, and his strength and his blessing and his freedom and his holiness and his righteousness. And I pray that you give us the wisdom to keep exercising this faith of ours in our action in loving one another and caring for people and being there for people. Thank you so much for everyone who has heard this message here right now and even through the, the videos and audios. I pray God that you ignite more wisdom beyond what I have spoken. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.